see you all. Uh, so tonight we're going to continue with our Bhakti Shastri course with the study of the Nectar of Devotion. And tonight we will begin with chapter nine of the uh, Nectar of Devotion. So uh, this chapter, uh, this section began in chapter six. Uh, chapter six, <clears throat> chapter seven, they describe uh, the beginning of the 64 Angas of devotional service. <clears throat> Chapter 6 describes the 64 ways that we can serve Krishna. And Chapter 7 begins to delineate or describe those different items. Chapter 8 uh, gives a description of the offenses which one may commit in devotional service. Uh, so that, that's chapter eight, which we uh, discussed two weeks ago. And tonight we'll go into chapter nine, where the 64 items of devotional service uh, uh, continue to be described and explained. So if you have any questions or any comments as we go, then please ask. We'll go through the different items which are mentioned in this chapter, chapter nine. Uh, the first one is blasphemy. So one should not blaspheme devotees of Krishna. Uh, one should not commit offense. This is called aparada. Aparada means against worship, or uh, yeah, rata means like to worship. So aparada means the opposite, uh, being blasphemous. Uh, it is just as easy, and we have to train ourselves to do this, because the nature of the mind in Kali Yuga is to find fault. I think all of us do that. Uh, it is said that in Kali Yuga, you do not get reactions for your thoughts. In other words, if you think something negative about someone, you don't get a reaction for that. Right? It's only when you do something or you uh, say something that you'll get a reaction. But just by thinking, uh, you don't get a reaction, which I've heard many descri devotees describe as being very fortunate. Right? Because... It's the nature of the conditioned soul in Kali Yuga to be blasphemous or to be critical or fault finding. And as we studied in the nectar of instruction, the nature of a, de of a devotee, an advanced devotee, an Uttama Adhikari, is that he is free from the propensity to criticize others. Uh, whereas a neophyte devotee likes to criticize others. That's actually a symptom or a sign of one's material disease, that one likes to criticize others. And as long as you do this, uh, the, the quality is called matsara. Matsara means envy. As long as you are envious, you can't enter the spiritual world. <clears throat> so if you enjoy criticizing others, keep doing it. And you will continuously, bahu jamma kadi Bahu jamma means you'll take birth again and again. In this world, you won't go back to Godhead to the spiritual world because the spiritual world is for those people who are near Matsura. Near Matsura means free from envy and free from the propensity to criticize other people. Bahu Maja. Bahu Jamma. Yeah, Bahu means many, many births. Yeah, so you'll take birth many, many times. You can still be a devotee but you will not transcend material energy. <clears throat> so it's very important to change our consciousness. So it's so important that Rupa Goswami uh, mentions it as one of the 64 uh, items of bhakti, uh, that one must not blaspheme. So if you blaspheme, then you will destroy your chances to advance in Krishna consciousness. So as it says here, one should not tolerate blasphemy of the Lord or his devotees. 
in this connection in the 10th canto, 74th chapter, verse 40 of Srimad Bhagavatam, Shukadev Goswami tells Parikshit Maharaj, My dear king, if a person after hearing blasphemous propaganda against the Lord and his devotees does not go away from that place, he becomes bereft of the effect of all pious activities. So, generally, uh, it is described that there are three options uh, for when you hear racism or blasphemy. <clears throat> Option number one is that you can defeat the person, which you can do if, in cert certain circumstances, you can do that. It's, it, it's, it works. Uh, second option is you can leave the place. Just go away from the place where the blasphemy is taking place. Just leave. And the third option is you can cut out their tongue, which is illegal in this day and age. So we don't opt for that option because we can't do that <laughs> at this point in time. But uh, we can defeat the person or we can go away. So if someone is blaspheming, we should avoid that personality. Someone who is a Kanishta Adhikari, a low-grade devotee, they will blaspheme others, they will criticize others. And as long as they criticize others, as long as, long as they blaspheme others, then we respect them in the mind, in the sense that we say, okay, they're a devotee of, of sorts. So we offer respect in the mind, but we distance ourselves from the person. And we don't associate intimately or closely with the person. Um, so as it says here, go away from that place where people are, are critical and avoid people. If you see there are devotees who are critical of others, then avoid their association. Uh, in one of Lord Chaitanya's Shikshastika verses, it is stated, the devotees should be more tolerant than the tree and more submissive than the grass. He should offer honor to others, but should not accept any honor for himself. So these four key elements of humility. Uh, this verse, which we just quoted in English, is from Shikshastika from the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. And uh, this third verse is said to be Siddha Pranali. Siddha Pranali means the giver of perfection. Uh, if you can perfect the consciousness in this verse, in the third verse, uh, you can transcend this material world once and for all. So, uh, uh, Siddha Pranali means Krishna's Kaviraj Goswami says that we should wear this verse, Trinata Pisa Nichina, this particular verse from Shikshaska, around our neck, like we wear Kanti Mala. Right? You should keep it close to your body, close to your throat, so that you do not blaspheme others. So there are four elements being humble like grass, being tolerant like a tree, offering respect to others, and not expecting respect. Of the four, uh, it is described that uh, offering all respect to others is the most important. And it will give rise to the others. If you can master this, just this one technique to always offer respect to others, then you will not, uh, you can transcend this material energy, uh, which means you have to become very exalted in your consciousness. And then automatically you won't expect respect for yourself. You'll be tolerant and you'll be humble. And as Lord Chaitanya says in this way, Kirtanya Ha Sadahari, you can chant the holy name continuously. Uh, if you don't perfect this uh, state of consciousness, you can't chant the holy name continuously. Just like sometimes we see in ourselves. When we're envious of others and we're chanting the holy name, we're chanting our japa, then while chanting, we spend a lot of our time meditating on 
those that we are envious of. We spend a lot of our time meditating on these people. So it means we're not actually chanting the holy name properly, attentively. So therefore, we can't chant continuously because our consciousness is material. So, as it says here, if we become more tolerant than the tree and more humble than grass, and always offer respect to others, then we then we can chant continuously because the consciousness will not be distracted by material envy and so forth. Uh, Okay, so then the next item of bhakti is wearing tilak and tulsi beads or kanti mala, these beads that we wear around our neck. In the Padma Purana, there is a statement describing how a Vaishnava should decorate his body with tilak and beads. Persons who put tulsi. Beads on the neck who mark the 12 places of their bodies as Vishnu temples with Vishnu's symbolic representations, the four items held in the four hands of Lord Vishnu, the conch, the mace, the disc, and the lotus, and who have Vishnu tilak on their foreheads are to be understood as the devotees of Lord Vishnu in this world. Their presence makes the world purified. And anywhere they remain, they make that place as good as Vaikuntha. So, uh, Lord Chaitanya says, a Vaishnava in Chaitanya Charitamrita, he says, a Vaishnava who does not wear tilak, uh, his body is like a corpse. It is not a, uh, it is not pure. Uh, tilak is the the emblem of the Vaishnava. Uh, the tilak that we use is called Gopi Chandan. Uh, it comes from near Dwarka, and it comes from a lake which, when the Gopi, Gopis visited Dwarka, they cried tears of ecstasy, and that earth or that mud uh, is made into tilak, and that's what we mark our foreheads with. So it is sacred. It is made, the mud is made from the tears of the gopis themselves. The shape of the tilak, uh, the two lines which come down to the, the nogs, uh, that is the toe, toe of Krishna, Krishna's toe. And then the tulsi leaf is what comes down our nogs. Uh, so that is the symbol of God, the symbol of Vishnu, the symbol of Krishna. And the Vaishnava, he wears that. And as it mentions, he should place the tilak on 12 parts of the body. And I remember many years ago in Melbourne, uh, His Holiness Jaipataka Swami was there. And he randomly would just go up to a group of devotees in the courtyard. And he would say, do you have tilak on all 12 places of your Because we get in the habit sometimes, we just put it on. Uh, just on the forehead, but uh, the actual system is that we should mark all 12 places of the body. And this denotes that the body is a temple of Krishna or Vishnu. So that, that's why we wear it. Uh, and then the Kanti Mala, it describes here that uh, the Kanti Mala is made from Tulsi, Tulsi wood, the roots or the wood of the Tulsi tree. And we wear that once again, because it is the symbol of the followers of Krishna or Vishnu. Prabhupada once described the Kanti Mala as being like a dog collar. Because devotees, we always wear it. You know, they break periodically and then we put on a fresh set. But, you know, there hasn't been a day since I became a, uh, a member of ISKCON that I haven't worn uh, my Kanti Mala. 
because it feels completely unnatural not to wear it. Uh, because uh, Prabhupada said it is like the dog collar. So Prabhupada says it means you have a master. So a devotee doesn't not wear it because he always feels, you know, feels strange not to wear it because then we think I'm not connected to my master. So that is the, the Kanti Mala. It mentions here in this section, Rupa Goswami explains, Prabhupada explains that uh, one who is wearing the tilak and the Kanti Mala, uh, the Yamadutas cannot touch him. He cannot go to Yama, he cannot be punished after death or receive a, how do you call it, a material destination. Uh, he will get a spiritual destination by wearing the tilak and the kanti mala. So, okay, so then the next item is accepting flower garlands. The garlands that are being uh, offered to Krishna. Now, uh, this particular verb, this particular item is called Nirmalya Dati. In Srimad Bhagavatam 11, 6, 46, Uddhava says, My dear Krishna, I have taken things which you have used and enjoyed, such as garlands, of flowers, saintly articles, garments, and ornaments. Nectar of Devotion, page 74. Uh, the phrase saintly articles should be scented oils. Uh, this was the Sanskrit word used for here, used here is Ganda. Uh, there's a, a phonetic similarity between saintly articles and scented oils. So Whoever transcribed Prabhupada's, uh, when Prabhupada was dictating on his dictaphone and then he would give the tapes, the devotee was listening and somehow he thought it said saintly articles, but actually it's scented oils. So it's written there in Nectar Devotion as saintly articles, but it's actually, uh, it should be, according to the Sanskrit, uh, scented oils. So, this is called prasad. Now, Uddhava is quoted. Uddhava is a, a very special personality because Uddhava, the word Uddhava means, it means like a walking festival. You know, some people are like that. I think like uh, somebody who comes to my mind is like Indra Swami. Like a walking festival, wherever it goes, just everything becomes a festival. So Uddhava is like that. And he was Krishna's cousin and his most intimate associate in Dwaraka. Outside of the residence of Vrindavan, he is the most exalted devotee. That's why Krishna sent him to Vrindavan, because he wanted Uddhava to see, actually, there's people even above you. Because he couldn't imagine. He thought, how could someone love Krishna more than me? He just couldn't imagine. And then when he met them, he thought, I don't have any love for Krishna. Comparatively, when now, now I meet the bridge buses, I realize my love is insignificant compared to theirs. That was his uh, realization. And then he uh, prayed to become a Kundalata. Kundalata means the creeper uh, on the bank of the Kunda. And if you go to Govardhan, you go to a place called Uddhava Kund, where it says that he still resides there as a creeper on the ground, so that the gopis, when they pass by, they will trample him with the dust of their feet. Because he felt that he couldn't approach them directly and ask them to give them, give him the dust of their feet. So he thought, if I take birth as a Lata, as a creeper, then I can just take the dust of their feet whenever they trample me. So, uh, Uddhava 
was so Krishna conscious, it describes he turned the same color as Krishna. Uh, he had the same complexion as Krishna. Sham Sundar, oh, that bluish blackish color. It also says Arjuna was that color. Although whenever Arjuna is depicted, generally we see he's depicted golden. Golden. Uh, but actually he's technically he's bluish black. And also uh, Mother Yashoda. We usually see her depicted. Uh, like golden color, but actually she's bluish black as well. Because they're so Krishna conscious, they actually become the same as Krishna. Think of him so much, they actually, their complexion turns that color. So Uddhava, that's how Krishna conscious he was. Uh, he was uh, the same color as Krishna. And when he went to Vrindavan, uh, the Gopis, when they first saw him, they thought, oh, is that Krishna? But then they realized, no, it's, uh, it's Uddhava. So Uddhava would only wear Krishna's remnants. He'd only wear Krishna's clothes. Because great people, great personalities, they only wear their clothes once. You know, we, we wash them and we wear them again wash them, wear them again. But, you know, people like Krishna and the Kauravas and the Pandavas, and they only wear their clothes once. Because they're very exalted personalities. So it's auspicious to have new clothing. So they always put on new clothes again and again and again. New clothes of it. Even it says, it actually describes Duryodhana took a vow he would never eat anyone's remnants. So that means he could only eat one mouthful if someone offered him a dish and they had to take it away and give him something else because he wouldn't even eat his own remnants. Right? He'd take it once and then he would, he would uh, they'd have to like, pull it and put something else there and he would eat and then take it and eat it. That's how he'd eat. Uh, yeah, it was uh, Duryodhana. So that, that's too much. Uh, well, other people would eat the, <laughs> it wouldn't get wasted. But, but even Krishna doesn't do that. <laughs> Duryodhana was very egotistical. Yeah, well, he had just like a whole palace surrounding him. So. Uh, but Uddhava would only wear the prasad or the clothes that were worn by Krishna. So he always had Krishna's uh, remnants on. He's got, that's why he looked like Krishna, because he wore the same color clothes as Krishna. And uh, he would only wear the clothes that uh, Krishna wore, and he would only take the remnants food left by Krishna, Krishna's prasad. Prabhupada actually said that the children in our movement, they can wear the deities. You know, occasionally we'll offer new clothes to the deities and then some of the old sets, then we'll take them away. I think generally now they auction them or they may be giving them to devotees, but Prabhupada actually said, the children can wear them because they're wearing Krishna's remnants. It's like wearing a garland. Or... So it was, it was like that. And he only ate Krishna's remnants. So he'd only eat prasad, which is what we should do. We don't always do that. And sometimes we eat food is not offered to Krishna. But, uh, we should only eat food which is offered to Krishna. It's called prasad. Uh, that will purify our consciousness. If we take that vow. Sometimes in Kartik, that's one of the vows I take. You know, because, you know, during the year, sometimes we eat bread or different things, cereals or whatever they are that are not offered to Krishna. But, you know, it's, a, it's one vow that you could take in Kartik. I'll only take prasad uh, for the whole month. Uh, so that's very purifying to only take the remnants offered to Krishna. So Uddhava, uh, he would wear Krishna's garments. 
So he put his garlands on. And as it says here, scented oils. Like in the morning, you know, all of us have been to Mongolati in the different ISKCON temples around the world. You know, after the Mongolati, before, as then the Sringa prayers begin in all the ISKCON temples, then they bring the scented oil, which has been offered to Krishna, and they touch it, and then, you know, we smell, become purified. So we should uh, accept all of these remnants which have been offered to Krishna. I remember one time I was in Vrindavan many years ago, and they had a garland on, which must have been from the altar, maybe the, the temple. And in ISKCON, we're spoiled, you know, because we get so much prasad, we just, we're kind of desensitized. You know, we get, everything's prasad for us, really. So I received a garland and I was walking down the alley behind the temple and I put the garland I was wearing on the rubbish pile because I thought, okay, I've worn it and now sooner or later I have to discard it. So I put on the rubbish and then I kept walking and I looked back and I saw some sadhus come and they picked up the garland and they put them on. Because they were thinking, they're conscious, they were thinking this is Krishna's remnants. And in my consciousness, I was thinking, this is Krishna's remnants, but I, I didn't have the same uh, intensity as they did in terms of my uh, attachment to the prasad. So all these different types of prasad uh, we should accept. Uh, and this is a way of honoring Krishna by wearing the garlands, which the deities have more. Um, sometimes uh, we quite often see devotees, you give them a garland, they put it on for a couple of moments, they take it off. Because I think the mentality is, I shouldn't wear this, I'm not such an exalted person, but actually it's the opposite. You should wear it <laughs> because it purifies us. Just like I gave class in Melbourne, uh, last time I gave class in the morning, and then, you know, when you give class, they offer you the garland of Srila Prabhupada from the day before. So it's Prabhupada's prasadam, it's his remnants. So after class, I gave that to one of the devotees who was, I hadn't seen them before, so maybe they're new or maybe they're visiting. And I said to them, don't throw this garland out, you know, at the end of the day, if you don't, you know, wear it as much as you can. And at the end of the day, when you're finished, hang it up in your home and it will purify your home. Right? So we should not disrespect Krishna's prasad and we shouldn't waste prasad, what we generally call prasad. All of this is prasad, the garlands, the clothes, the oils, the food stuff, which is offered to Krishna, it's all prasad, but generally we, we call the food stuff prasad when it wants to be offered to Krishna. You should never waste prasadam. That's one rule. You should never, and we see devotees do this often. You know, they leave remnants on their plate. You, know, you never take onto your plate more than you can eat. Right? Once you've finished it, then you take more. And if you finish that and you're still hungry, you take more. But you should never waste prasadam. That's, it's actually apparat or offensive. If, if there is, for some reason, extra prasad on your plate, uh, you should make sure it's actually supposed to go in a body of water or buried in the earth. Well, generally, we give it to other living entities. We give it to the dog or you could say the insects, the worms, or the birds, yeah, or, or the pig. You know, here, close to our farm here at Hare Krishna Valley, and one of our friends is a pig uh, named Penny Davy. And we, yeah, yeah. Bhakti and Penny. So we give uh, Krishna's remnants quite often to the pig. So the pig is benefiting. So you have to make sure it is discarded properly if it is discarded. Okay. Uh, the next item is dancing before the deity. 
Uh, in the Dwarka Mahatmya, the importance of dancing before the deity is stated by Krishna as follows. A person who is in a jubilant spirit, who feels profound devotional ecstasy while dancing before me, and who manifests different features of bodily expression, can burn away all accumulated sinful reactions. He has stocked up for many, many thousands of years. In the same book, there is a statement by Narada, wherein, wherein he asserts, from the body of any person who claps and dances before the deity, showing manifestations of ecstasy, all the birds of sinful activities fly away upward. Just as by clapping the hands, one can cause many birds to fly away. Similarly, the birds of all sinful activities, which are sitting on the body, can be made to fly away simply by dancing and clapping before the deity of Krishna. So, dancing in front of the deity. Shri Prabhupada says, has explained to us that in Kali Yuga, if you just dance and chant in front of the deities of Gornitai, you can go back to Godhead. You don't even have to get initiated. So powerful, the process. If you just dance and chant with bhakti, with devotion, in front of the deities of Gora and Nittai, you can, the Loka Prapti, you can go back to the spiritual world. That's how powerful the, uh, the system is. So we should follow that system. We should dance and chant. And it says, clap your hands. You clap the hands, Prabhupada said three times. All the lines on the on the palm, they can change. In other words, your destiny can change. I don't know palmistry, so the junction there's different junctions in your life. If you can read it, I've had astrologers read it. They say, Oh, at this age something will happen, and this age something will happen. Interesting, the, the junctions on your life. So all that can change, whatever's there, you know, your bad karma, your good karma can all change just by clapping your hands in front of Krishna. So this is one of the items of bhakti that we dance and chant, clap our hands before the deities of, of Krishna. Uh, the next item is bowing down in honor of the deity. A person, this is from the Naradiya Purana, a person who has performed a great ritualistic sacrifice and a person who has simply offered his respectful obeisances by bowing down before the, the Lord cannot be held as equals. Very, that's a very powerful statement. Some of these statements are extremely powerful. I was driving in the car today back to the farm and I was listening to a lecture by His Holiness uh, Radhana Swami uh, about, uh, in Jagannath Puri, about the glories of Jagannath Puri. And there are statements like this, that it says that, uh, you know, the people in Jagannath Puri, Jagannath Puri is so powerful, there's statements in the Shastra, it says even, because they eat a lot of fish there, uh, because it's on the ocean, so. Uh, the fish you see in the mornings, all, all the fishermen go out. And it's, all through the marketplace, there's, there's fish. For sale. Uh, it actually says in the Shastra, those who eat fish in Puri get the benefit of taking prasad. That's how powerful the dharma is. And Maharaj stopped and looked at everyone and said, but doesn't mean any of you. <laughs> Doesn't mean any of you, everyone laughed. That would be a dumb person. Yeah, you'd have to uh, be doing it ignorantly because we, a devotee would never do it, Vaishnava would never do it. But yeah. But the people who visit, they may, they still get benefit because the dharma is so powerful. Yeah, the dharma is so powerful just by being there. So, it says here that 
Someone can do a great jagya, but the person who just walks in the temple and bows down before the deity of Krishna gets more benefit than the person who performs a great sacrifice, a great jagya. That's, that's how powerful that is. And once again, something we take for granted. Yeah, I paid my obeisances last night to Jagannath Balaram Subhadra and Gornitai and Radha Balaba. But we take it for granted. We don't understand how potent that, uh, that activity is. You know, we don't, we don't always absorb ourselves properly while we're doing it. Yeah, how, how powerful, how, how beneficial that uh, item of bhakti is. So it says here that one who does that will not come back to this world, but he will go directly to the abode of Krishna. I mean, that's a very powerful statement. <laughs> Just by bowing before the deities, you won't come back to this world again. What that means is your, your consciousness has to change. You know, because you can do that thousands of times, but it depends on your consciousness while you're doing it. But if you do it with the right level of consciousness, with the right level of devotion, you can go back to Godhead just from that one activity. Who was it who used to do it thousands of times? Uh, Raghunathas, first one. He would bow down thousands of times every day. So when we bow down, I think, did we mention this? Uh, we went through the offenses, I think, that Bowing down means nine places of the body, parts of the body. Nine parts of the body must touch the ground. The forehead, the two hands, the two elbows, the two knees, and the two feet. That is considered complete obeisances. Prostrate, although you can even just, you don't have to prostrate, but you can just uh, kneel. Yeah, but all nine places have to touch. So full dandavas, the men, and the women generally, they just bow down, they don't do full dandavas. Chest touching the ground as a woman. Yeah. Although when you see the very early footage of this one, sometimes the women would offer full obeisances as well. But actually, it's not eti uh, generally in terms of etiquette, it's not generally done. It's rare you'll see that in India. Sometimes you see the women roll in the temple. Yeah. You know. Uh, uh, but the, yeah, that that's accepted because that's that when it's done with bath. Uh, I've seen it. There's when you go to Radha Dhamma Dhammada temple about four in the afternoon for the Aarti when the deities wake up, and there's a group of Madhijis who come and they obviously have deep devotion and they chant songs for Krishna together. Very powerful, very beautiful, and they roll. You see, when they do it, it's it's uh, it's a very powerful activity, but it's not generally the etiquette. But the point is, when we offer obeisances, we must do it with all parts of the body, because that represents full surrender. Which means you're giving everything, and you're not holding anything back. You can't hide anything. It's very vulnerable. Very vulnerable. Yeah, it says when the uh, the wife sees the husband first thing in the morning, she should offer obeisances. Yeah, we'll find it for you. Right. Also says when the children see the the, the father, the parents in the morning, they should also offer obeisances. And so, made the statements like this it, uh, through the through the shastra. So we can find. It. We can find it. People have to be worthy of their obeisances. They have to be worthy. And then uh, Gorka showed us Babaji Maharaj one time. He was asked uh, something about it, about the wife offering obeisances to the husband. And then that, and he said the husband should offer obeisances to the wife uh, if she is a devotee. Same thing. So he should offer obeisances to the wife. Uh, so that should be the system that someone... Uh, we bow down. So there's great benefit in bowing down. I always say this actually when we go to the holy dams and we take devotees there and we have our introduction 
uh, when we first arrive, orientation. We sit down with everyone, we explain some etiquettes. And we always say, devotees, bow down as much as you can to the deities, to Tulsi Devi, to the Vaishnavas, to the Dambasis. Just bow down as much as you can because it, it purifies your consciousness. So it's a very important item of bhakti. The next item, uh, standing up to receive the Lord. A person who sees the Lord's Rathiyatra festival and then stands up to receive the Lord can purge all kinds of sinful results from his body. So we should stand up. Like when the RT is on, we should stand. Yeah, we say that actually when people come here for the RT, we say, please stand. Yeah, I mean, if they're brand new, we say, you know, if you want to sit down, that's okay. But, but uh, that's actually the etiquette. And you should stand properly as well. You know, sometimes you see in the temple during the arti, like sometimes people stand like this, or, you know, the arms crossed. It's not appropriate body language before the deity, before someone respectful, before a, a greater personality. So we should stand up to respect the, the great personality. Following the deity, in the Bhavishya Purana, it says, even if born in a lowly family, a person who follows the Rathiyatra car when the deities pass in front or from behind will surely be elevated to the position of achieving equal opulence with Vishnu. Right? So following the deity, right? if there's a procession, you, you should follow. That's the system. Uh, if there's a Rathiyatra, you should attend Rathiyatra. No? We should follow the deity or pull the deity in the case of the Rathiyatra, go on, go on the front. Uh, whatever the, but you know, generally there's some festival where the deity comes out of the temple, then you should follow. That's the proper respect. Now, I was there one time uh, in Mayapur and one of Prabhupada's disciples, his name was Nirguna Prabhu, and he left his body while we, while we were there. I got to massage his feet day or two before he left and then uh, then he left his body and then I was chanting at my guru's samadhi and they went past with his body, you know, many devotees during the kirtan. So we got up and we followed. We went to the Ganga and then they cremated his body and then Janani Vas Prabhu and Pankajangri Prabhu, they, because it says the funerals uh, contaminate Consciousness on the conscious, but like the yeah, the body, the clothing, and everything is considered contaminating. So they just jumped in the Ganga with all their clothes on, their dhoti and everything, just jumped in. So then we all did it too because they did it, and then we all walked back to the temple, you know, soaking, dripping wet from being in the Ganga. Uh, so there's the system. When there's a ceremony, you should follow. Uh, going to the temple of Vishnu or to places of pilgrimage. So uh, we should go to the temple as much as possible. Um, as, as Prabhupada says here, as we have explained previously, Vrindava, Mathura, and Dwarka. The system is that all the devotees take advantage of visiting various temples situated in those holy places. It is stated in Hari Bhakti Sudodaya. Persons who are empowered by pure devotional service in Krishna consciousness and who therefore go to see the deities of Vishnu in the temple will surely get relief from entering again into the prison house of a mother's womb. So we should go to the temple. <laughs> go and visit the deities, go to the temple. You see in places like Brindavan, everyone goes to the temples in the morning. Everyone just goes to the temple. And then again in the evening, that's also the tradition. Right? People go in the morning, they go in the evening, they go and visit the Lord. That's the system, that's an item of bhakti. And as it says here, uh, we should also go to places of pilgrimage, you know, like uh, 
Mayapur, Puri, Brindavan, Dwaraka. There's holy dams. We should go to those places as much as we can. I was, I was saying the other day that Prabhupada, he said that uh, we should go to the holy dam once a year. My guru also gave me that instruction. That's why I tried to follow that instruction. Uh, and then, you know, in the 70s, I think it was 74 maybe, then they were sending 300 devotees to the Mayapur festival. Might have even been the first Mayapur festival. 300 devotees. So it cost $300,000 to send them all. You know, uh, plane tickets thousand dollars or so. So then uh, they said to Prabhupada, Ramashwara Prabhu, we said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, why don't we just not send everyone and we use the three hundred thousand dollars for the BBT to print more books? And Prabhupada said, No, he said everyone should come. That that was the how much emphasis Prabhupada placed on visiting the holy dams. Mayapur, Puri, Vrindavan, and uh, to visit the temples also, because like in Melbourne, we had this beautiful temple established by Prabhupada himself. The deities were installed by Prabhupada himself. It is a territory, it is a holy dharma. It is a replica of Vrindavan, and Mayapur and Puri in that temple. So we should visit these places as much as we can to get purified in our consciousness. Circumambulating the temple of Vishnu. Not to go around the temple. Uh, once again, says those who do that will not see the cycle of repeated birth and death. So we should go around the temple. I remember when we first moved here, and during Kartik, we would have Dhammadarastika in the evening, and we used to go around the temple three times. I think that's when the deities were actually uh, here. We used to go around. Uh, so you should circumambulate the temple. Like in Mayapur and Brindavan, there's a paragraph mark around the temple and the deities. So you should go around. That's, that's, I think, uh, one time the devotees say that tomorrow Krishna was saying that one of the festivals, Radhashtami or something, uh, they, they took a vow to walk around 108 times around the deities. So they walked around, Radha Malabara, 108 times went around. And I think the last time they did Dundavas, uh, I think in my book, went around. So, you know, this is very auspicious, very purifying to circumambulate the, the temple or the deity. Archana. Archana means worship of the deity in the temple. Sadhana Bhakti is meant to help us remember Krishna by using our mind and senses in his in his service worshiping the deity is an excellent way to achieve such remembrance this chapter lists some of the many ways that deity worship can engage the senses of the lord in the lord's service item number 23 accepting garlands 24 dancing before the deity 25 bowing down in honor of the deity 26 standing up to receive the lord 27 following the deity 28, going to the temple. 29, circumambulating the temple. 31, rendering service to the Lord. 37, partaking of prasad. 38, drinking charanamrita. 39, smelling the incense and flowers offered to the deity. 40, touching the deity. 41, seeing the deity. And 42, observing the arti of the deity. So you can see that many of the 64 items pertain to the deity. Uh, so this is called Archana. It is one of the uh, nine principal angas of bhakti, which, which have been mentioned by Prahlad Maharaj in the seventh canto of the Bhagavatam. Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smaranam, Padasevanam, Archanam, Bandanam, Dashyam, Sakyam, Atman, Nivedanam. There's nine processes. So of the nine, well, these nine have been expanded into these 64 items, all those 64 within those nine. And many of them pertain to deity worship directly, Archana. Because Rishikesha, Rishikena, 
Rishikesha, Sevana Bhakti Uchite. We need to engage our senses in the service of the master of the senses. That's why we worship the deity, because it purifies our senses. Rendering service to the Lord. So this is the next uh, item of bhakti. It is called uh, Hari Charya. Uh, it is very similar to the previous item, Archana. Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada points out the difference. Archana means to worship the deities in the temple. Rendering service to the Lord means worshiping Krishna in just the way that a king is worshipped in his palace. This is from page 78. So we should render service to the Lord, uh, just like the king is worshipped in his palace. Prabhupada points out in the purport that uh, if one is rich, uh, then he should arrange to construct costly temples uh, and opulent deity worship. Just like we're seeing Ambarish Prabhu in Mayapur. Uh, you know, he's giving over $30 million because he's a rich person uh, to build the temple, TOVP. And I know there's uh, some devotees in Melbourne. I, well, you know, one family in Melbourne, I know they gave a million dollars uh, to build the TOVP, that temple in, in Mayapur. So if you're wealthy, you should use the wealth in the service of Krishna. If you're poor, you should use your time and energy in the service of Krishna. Uh, but those who have wealth, they should use that wealth in Krishna's service. So this is rendering service unto the Lord. In uh, his commentary on this book, the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, Jiva Goswami says, uh, Paricharya means using the same accessories we would use to serve a king, to serve the deity. For example, when the deity goes on procession, we should carry him in a palanquin, hold an umbrella above his head, and fan him with a chum or a whisk. Uh, so that's how we should worship the, the deity. Uh, you know, has anyone ever carried you around in a palanquin? I've never been carried around in a palanquin, but you know, it's a very uh, it, it's it's the service you render to an exalted person. You know, they're carried in a palanquin, so the deity is the most exalted person. So we carry the deity in the palanquin, you know, or we put him on the rough cart. You know, we have a car, but you know, Krishna goes on a chariot. You know, imagine you went through St. Kilda on the rough yatra car. Yeah, everyone would be, oh, who's this person? Yeah, yeah, be going through on such a grand cart. Um, or if someone's walking behind you, you know, fanning you with a chamara. You know, if you saw that, you think, oh, this person's very important. Or uh, if they, as it says here, uh, they carry an umbrella above your head. Like we do for the deities, you know, we carry the umbrella. And so that means the person is a very exalted person. So we should offer these kind of services. This is what this item of rendering service to the Lord refers to. Uh, singing. There is a statement about glorifying the Lord. A Brahmana who is constantly engaged in singing the glories of the Lord is surely elevated to the same planet as the Lord himself. One time Prabhupada came into the temple and a devotee was doing arati. And normally the devotee would put on a tape during the arati. Quite often in the temples, they put a tape on or a CD. You know, they play, play music, bhajan or kirtan, while they're doing the arati. So at one time, uh, that wasn't happening. So then Prabhupada said to the, he walked in and the devotee was doing the our team, Prabhupada said to the Prajari, said, you should sing. Why are you doing the arti? You should sing. So then, you know, you begin to chant. You know, if there's no recording or something, then you should do it. Or while you're doing it, you can sing along with. 
the uh, the uh, the kiritan. So that is singing for the pleasure of the Lord. Sankiritan, congregational chanting. According to Rupa Goswami, Sankirtan refers to, refers not only to the congregational chanting of the Lord, uh, congregational chanting of the holy name, but to loudly the glories of the Lord's pastimes, qualities, etc. So this is called Sankirtan. Uh, Guru Jabaru, he more or less started within ISKCON, uh, what he calls uh, uh, Leela Sankirtan. You know, like we have Nam Sankirtan. Nam means you chant the holy names. Uh, but he has Leela Kirtans, where he reads pastimes of the Lord, and then intermittently they chant the holy name. So it's called Leela Kirtan. You know, he's well known in his for doing this. So this is the process, as is being mentioned here. Uh, that one should uh, chant the glories of the Lord's holy name, uh, but also his pastimes, his qualities, etc. Uh, then the next quality is japa. Uh, japa means, as Prabhupada says here, chanting the mantra or hymn softly and slowly is called japa, right? And chanting the mantra loudly is called kirtan. Uh, so we chant japa, it's meditative. Uh, very softly, that's japa. That's, that's japa. In ISKCON, sometimes it's loud. That's not actually uh, japa. Submission. Submission uh, is a personal prayer in which we express our own sentiments to Krishna. So this is different to the next item because the next item is uh, chanting notable prayers. But we, submission means uh, we chant prayers to the Lord which are from our heart. You know, we may pray something or, you know, we may say something to the Lord, which is just something that we pray to the Lord. The next item is chanting notable prayers, where you remember, you memorize prayers from the Shastra or from great devotees, and then you offer those prayers to the Lord. That's an item of bhakti. You know, you might go to Pratana, Narottam okay? Dastako. And you learn some of the verses because you're trying to understand his mood in rendering service to Krishna. Uh, but this one is called submission, which means you offer the prayers from your own heart. One can express himself to the Lord in three ways. Samprata, nat, nat mika, expressing our heartfelt desire for spontaneous service. Danya, Bodhika, expressing our insignificance before the deity. And Lala Samai, expressing our desire for a specific spiritual perfection. So, uh, it is mentioned here that uh, Lala Samai you know, asking for a specific spiritual uh, position in relationship to Krishna, a uh, specific spiritual perfection, that's very advanced. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Trying to understand your stay bhav or your permanent relationship with Krishna. So, yeah, you're, yeah, as you said, you're, ras you're rasa. Not asking for things that you need to do, but you're asking to uncover my eternal relationship. Is that what you're saying? Could be both. Could be both. Yeah, could be just both. Just, just desiring some, desiring that stage. Yeah, could could be both. But the way you said it's better. 
way you said it's been. So, uh, but yeah, it means to ask for that. That's very advanced. Lala Samai, like you're hankering. I want to serve Krishna in this way, like uh, Narottama Dastakra says, Radha Krishna Pranamo. I want to serve Radha and Krishna. That's his mood. Yeah? So he sings his bhajans in that mood. Part of Pratana is called Lala Samai, hankering. When will I? When will I serve them in this way? So that's very advanced. So then the next item is reciting notable prayers. So we memorize prayers, which are very exalted, and we we recite those prayers because we want to enter the mood of those prayers. That's a very powerful way to advance in Krishna consciousness. So Sharanagati by Bhaktivinoda Thakur or Pratana uh, by Narottama Das Thakur. Uh, by reciting these prayers, a very powerful way to uh, evoke our Krishna consciousness. The next item is partaking of prasad. Uh, so it says, do not take on of the prasad in front of the deity. So you shouldn't directly in front of the deity. Right? You should not on a prasad. Unless it's a very, like a morsel. You get a little morsel and you take like that. That's permissible, but you don't sit down and have a meal in front of the deity. Picture's not, yeah, it's not the same as the deity. Not an offense. Not not an offense. Not an offense. Uh, drinking Charanamrita. So Charanamrita, just taking that Charan means the feet, Amrita means the nectar coming from the feet. In Melbourne Temple, for example, we're very fortunate because in the mornings, uh, the Pujaris, they bathe the Shalagram Shila. It was non different from the Lord. And that bathing water is then mixed with yogurt uh, and honey and then uh, is given to us in the form of the charanamrita, which we take when we go into the temple. That's very purifying, very powerful. Uh, yeah, I mean, when I take the charanamrita in Melbourne, I feel very purified. Yeah, all, all the temples around the world, but Melbourne charanamrita is very powerful. I always feel very purified by taking that. Uh, smelling the incense and flowers offered to the deity. So you offer the incense or offer the flowers that purifies the sense of smell. Uh, so then we smell. So the basic concept is whatever we touch, whatever we taste, whatever we smell, whatever we see and whatever we hear, it all should be offered to Krishna. And then we get purified. So that's prasad. So that's how we purify. We like to smell nice things. Offer it to the deity first. That's all. You know, make your house smell nice. Then offer the incense to the deity first, and then your house will smell very nice. Uh, touching the deity. This is, of course, a great privilege, and that is only given to those in ISKCON who are twice initiated. Or brahmanas, then they are allowed to touch the form of the deity, which is extremely purifying for anyone who has had that opportunity. Did you see people doing it on Sanadi Yatra? Yeah. Necessarily being initiated. Yeah, that's debatable whether that should be done or not. Yeah. The, the minister of deity worship in ISKCON is not in favor of it. Yeah. And then the Lord get sick of that. Yeah. Uh, seeing the deity. Uh, so going to see the deity. I remember Jag, uh, in Jagannath Puri, we went to see the deity of Toda Gopinath, who is extreme, one of the most powerful and important deities in our Sampradaya. Lord Chaitanya himself entered into that deity at the end of his pastimes. And the first time I went there, Mother Jagatarini said, take Darshan for a long time. 
So I always remember that whenever I see the deities, any of our deities, I try to have a nice dasha. You know, the longer the better, actually. You know, according to practical practicalities, but sometimes you just need to just go and see the deities. Just take dasha. It's very purifying for the consciousness. And the final item for this uh, chapter, chapter nine, is observing arti and celebrations of the Lord. So to observe the arti, the worshiping ceremony, actually. In a cultured society, you'll see, like when you go to the temple, even Melbourne Temple, I was there last night at nine o'clock for the final RT. The, the, the Indian people who come, it is the culture to not leave before the RT is finished. We don't do that. We go in and out. You know, like I did that last night. I go in, see the deities, and then I leave. But actually, the, the culture is you should stay there for the whole RT ceremony. That's actually the they're very purifying to be a part of that ceremony because when the pujari is offering the items to the deity he's doing that on behalf of everyone in the audience so we're all meditating that we are assisting the pujari in doing that service so in that way we all become purified yeah it's not different uh, and observing the celebrations of the lord so last week we had in the Chaturdasi. And then I think the next lot of festivals will be Jolan Yatra and Baladev Purnim, Jamashtami, Radhashtami. Then Kartik will come. And these are the next. So you must observe the festivals. Sometimes we get caught, so caught up in service, we think, oh, you know, I'll just do my. No, you have to observe the festival. Right? It's the way you become purified. <laughs> so it's very important. It's one of the items. So next week, We'll go through chapter 10 and we'll continue the uh, other items of bhakti. Thank you all for coming. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Or... Okay, we'll see you next week. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Jai. Hare Krishna. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you soon. <laughs>